are now listening to Educate, the most fired up educational podcast there is. Educate is all about the quality education access to students and how we can provide research-based solutions to free the young minds of the world. On this podcast, we will be exploring different educational experiences, education's greatest of debates, and more. The hottest educational podcast out. Educate is brought to you from the Albany State University's very own Center for Educational Opportunity. Enjoy. All right. So in today's episode, we will be discussing charter school authorizing, education advocacy, single site charter schools, and K-12 through to HBCU pipelines. We have a special guest today, Naomi Shelton. If you would like to introduce yourself to the listeners and just give them a little bit of background information about who you are and what you do. Sure, my name is Naomi Shelton. I am the CEO of the National Charter Collaborative, a organization that represents and advocates on behalf of more than 500 leaders of color who have founded and currently lead single site charter schools throughout the country. Okay, thank you for that. So I wanted to start off by asking you, what comes to your mind when you hear the phrase changing the narrative? So changing the narrative means several things to me. I, you know, of course, I could go into a whole diatribe about about what that means, but it essentially means, you know, we've had conversations around education for the last 15, if not more so years that have really been based in a deficit narrative and how everything is terrible. What is wrong with all of the things that are related to education for children of color, specifically for black children? The way that I see that is how do we amplify and how do we think about all the things that are working, that haven't been brought to scale, that could expand and really shift what's possible for students of color? We have seen in pockets across our country where people are able to have the ability to think about their work differently, to have the autonomy to operate their work differently, and who actually think about children in a particular way because they either have similar lived experiences or because their experience has taught them that advocating on behalf for the least of these will make sure that more people have the ability to succeed. So I believe that shifting the narrative is really looking at not what's wrong, not only what's wrong, but what we've seen that works to shift what's possible for kids. Wow, so can you give me an example of an hands-on experience that you've been through where you actually helped change the narrative in some ways? So I guess I would speak to two different things and how I came in, how I come into this work. I started working for the mayor of Washington, D.C. back in 2007, worked on the campaign to elect the youngest mayor ever elected in the nation's capital, Washington, D.C., Mayor Adrian Fenty. And he, you know, established several goals that he wanted to see to make sure that we were living in the not only the city uh, of Washington, D.C., but thinking about it as a, a world class city. And in changing that narrative, and I, you know, of course, we didn't frame it that way at that time, but in changing that narrative, the idea around what do we want to see happen for schools? You know, there's all types of debates around power and control. But when you think about it and really get down to the nooks and crannies of that, how is it that shifting who's responsible, who's held accountable, what are we thinking about when we're talking about in operating schools, uh, shifting what that means and what that looks like means that you can have exponential impact. I mean, so during that administration, while I worked in the executive office of the mayor, I wasn't directly working for the D.C. public charter, D.C. public school system. However, I was related and engaged with the folks that were managing the shift from a traditional elected school board to mayoral control. And so that narrative also included making sure that money that had been allocated to do different types of renovations and updates to schools that that money was actually allocated where it was supposed to be. And those, all of those things, all of the renovations, all of the updates actually took place. And so in doing that, so not only shifting accountability, but then shifting what school buildings look like for kids. There were buildings in our school system that hadn't been updated in multiple decades. There were schools in our traditional system that 
just had, you know, barely had windows, right? And so st students were walking into schools that felt very, you know, re remote and removed from the rest of the world, but also enclosing them in spaces that were not open to like the light of what else is outside. And so in, in that work, that kind of sparked for me what's possible when you really do dig down into shifting how things operate to improve. And so while education was one of the issues that caused Mayor Fenty not to win his bid for re-election. When we talked to people during the re-election campaign, people were very clear about overall that the shifts that were made, they liked. People just didn't like not being engaged and involved in those shifts. Well, it's two things that came to my mind when you were talking. <laughs> and I actually went to a high school that did not have windows. And I can recall just being in class and feeling almost in like it was a it was a mixture of claustrophobic and bonded like <laughs> you know you really you don't know if it's if it's raining or if it's snowing you know you don't know if it's a sunny day outside unless you have PE or unless it's the end of the school year or um, school day and so i definitely understand the focus of making sure that, you know, we improve students' environments because that actually does affect how students learn. That's and that affects how students feel, you know, we adapt to our environment. And if it's not a conducive learning environment, then that might increase behavior issues or it might, you know, increase or decrease, you know, learning. And so I definitely agree with that. And I want to ask you another question. If because, you know, I've, I've heard you say in engagement. And so I wanted to know, does authentic engagement have anything to do with changing the narrative? Absolutely. And I bring up engagement because engagement was, again, one of the things that people spoke to in terms of what was lacking throughout Fenty's administration. Of course, no matter what you do, I believe it's Maya Angelou's quote, people won't remember what they do, but they'll remember how you make them feel. And we, you know, of course, when you're working in government or you're working in corporate America or you're working in whatever field, you're thinking about the data, you're you're creating a, a system, you're thinking about um, processes. And what we take out of that is the humanity of how people operate. And in taking out the humanity of how people operate, you are then stripping the ability for people to have influence into whatever it is that you're trying to change. You know, in business, you want people to buy your, your product. In public service, you want people to feel served and to feel included and to be not only served, but heard. If someone speaks to what their needs and desires are, if you go out and do, if they want ABC and you do XYZ, that means you never listen to them. And so engagement is a thing of how are we talking to people? How are we making sure their feedback loops? You know, I, I try to strip away all of the like the language that comes along with, with that, the consultancy or, con you know, that language. But the feedback loops and how do we think about what it is that people have to offer? when it comes to providing them the end service or end goal of what it is that needs to shift or change. And that doesn't happen if you are constantly you know, searching for data, only looking at best practices that have happened in other places or only taking the ideas of sometimes the best and the brightest because there's also untapped intellect, untapped knowledge, untapped resources within communities who have just not had the resources to be able to contribute in the ways that you know people in business, education, and in all other facets of the work related to education or otherwise. We just don't tap into other people. So that engagement is, making sure that people know what it is that the people who are making decisions know what it is that the people who will be impacted by those decisions, what they want, and then coming to a collective decision-making process from there. Well, yes. And I, I definitely understand that. I kind of wanted to dig a little deeper into what we were discussing a little bit earlier about African-American kids and, and black and brown kids and just the, the resources that they have and how we can change the narrative for them specifically. A deeper question that I have for K through 12 and the HBCU pipeline, how can authentic engagement help them specifically when we're thinking about, you know, kids that are coming from elementary to high school and actually trying to push them through to collegiate education, but specifically HBCU colleges? 
Sure. So I, I will take a step back and just give context to where my framing comes from for this. I spent six and a half, nearly seven years working for the United Negro College Fund for UNCF, but leading and helping to manage their K-12 advocacy work. And that is how I, I come to the work that I do today. That work was really seeded by research conducted to look at what do African-American parents believe about education from the K-12 perspective. And so I'm going to work backwards and tell you about about the K-12 perceptions research that UNCF produced from 2012 all the way up until 2016, 17. And I'll work backwards. So the, the research was parents, grass tops leaders, and that's inclusive, or when you think of grassroots, think about the people that are, you know, from the, from the top down that are influential. So clergy, business leaders, education leaders, et cetera. And then you have students. So there was student research conducted by UNCF, and it's called A Seat at the Table. It's African-American Youth Perceptions of K-12 Education. And in that, and I think hearing students and knowing that people often think of students and young people as people who should be seen and not heard, I know that that's what the, the adage was when I was growing up. And I'm sure my mother and other generations prior to, but we recognize that students also understand what's happening to them day to day. And sometimes they often have collective power to be able to shift what's happening in their schools. But in some communities, they don't. And that is by design. And so students and their voice and recognizing how important it is to you know, receive education beyond high school. Students from low-income families strongly agree. Almost 90% of students know that it is important to have, you know, to go on to higher education. But do we create the opportunities for them to do that? And they recognize that race is a, uh, one of those limiting factors in that opportunity. They also recognize that education is a priority for them, right? And that there are their learning environments are important. They also recognize that discipline is an issue in schools. 36% of students received out of school suspensions of the students that were included in that, that data set. And so they know, they know that their schools don't have enough counselors. They know all the things that they want to have adults who are supposed to be working on their behalf, what they should be shifting and doing to make that stuff happen. And so in the work that I do now, the work that I do every day with the National Charter Collaborative is there are adults who have created schools to serve particular communities, right? And it looks different from state to state, from region to region, but a lot of those school leaders have taken what they've learned over time from students, from their educational backgrounds, to really think about and, and build schools and create schools that are, are taking the student perception in mind as they develop their school programs and the academic and cultural conditions for their schools. So I heard you mention the charter schools, and I know in the topic that we're discussing today, one of those were charter schools authorizing. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to know how does meaningful authorizing relate to charter school authorizing? So one of the things that I did not mention that I do is I also serve as a member of the DC Public Charter School Board, which is the authorizing body for charter schools in the district. Now, every state and cities operate differently in terms of how they authorize charter schools. DC has an independent agency that was created by our School Reform Act, and that act being the ability to create autonomous schools that receive public dollars and is a delivery mechanism to allow for autonomy for school leaders to create the curriculum and conditions that make the most sense for their student body. But it also, the board serves as like authorizer that approves, reviews, and also can revoke charters in the District of Columbia. I was appointed by Mayor Muriel Bowser back in 2017, 18. Of course, now I can't remember because time has been flying and time right now doesn't feel real <laughs> in the middle of a pandemic. But serving as an authorizer means that we have the opportunity to see what's possible, see how different learning environments shift things for different types of students. I think the pandemic, of course, has shown us what it looks like to have individual learning plans that parents now have a different recognition for how their students learn asynchronously or whether or not they have the ability to just do their work on their own and making sure 
that, you know, the ways that we've thought about the delivery mechanism of education, how it's possible to do that differently. So I say that to say that authorizing means that you are from, you know, from beginning to end, you review applications. So a founding team will supply an application to say why it is that they want to open a school, how they plan to implement their plan of what the school will look like. What, and when I say look like, not just the aesthetics, but actually how it functions. So all the operationalizing of school, everything that a central office does in a traditional school district, that that happens within that school. And that's called an LEA, right? Or of course now of my brain is like, what's an LEA? Because I know all these acronyms. And though that LEA has the ability to, to create everything from how students get to school, so their transportation, again, operations, the hiring and firing of teachers, the ongoing process of the ecosystem of schooling happens within that school, either that single site or a larger network of schools. And so, do, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. So just to, just to finish out that point, so the, uh, the, the school is either approved or denied. And if they are approved, they are able to open their school, go through a process of recruiting students, et cetera. And then every five years, they are reviewed to make sure they are upholding the, the goals that they set for themselves, the academic goals that are set, you know, that are federally mandated in terms of delivery to special needs students, et cetera. And every five years that occurs, they either have the ability to continue or to not. Right. And so and I'll just skip over a couple of the details that happen in between there but that would initiate if they do not meet their goals, if the academic goals are not met, if all of those things that they are supposed to do are, don't happen the way that they should, uh, the revocation process takes place and they can either appeal and have a, a, a reason to continue or a school will close. OK, I was just going <laughs> to I was going to ask if parents or community members had any type of control or effect on charter school authorizing or LEAs? Like, do they have a voice in who the school will serve and the the area and how the school will look, you know, and, and how it will function? Yeah. And so I will say this, there are, uh, there are plenty of organizations that are involved and engaged around education overall. So an LEA, which is a local education agency, those individuals over time. So uh, um, the first charter law was passed in, um, was passed 30 years ago, right? This year makes 30 years. DC is hovering around the 25 year mark. And essentially the community has not necessarily been engaged up until uh, the last few years and how, what that process in terms of applying looks like. There was community engagement, but so, certainly for pockets of communities. And so not only DC Public Charter School Board, but the national association that thinks about authorizing across this, the country, because authorizing looks different in so many different places, is also thinking about what does it mean to engage communities in developing what's possible for the development of new schools. So, of course, ramping up to the development of schools. But on the other side of that, for schools that already exist, how do they shift how they've engaged with the communities where their schools are located? How do they engage with communities where they want to locate a school? What does that look like? And so NAXA, which again is the National Association of Charter School Authorizers, NAXA has been thinking about how do we shift to think about education differently and how families and community involved in that process. Hi, thank you for that. So mm -hmm. as we close up with my last question, I just wanted to ask, what do you think is possible for the power of students, school leaders, and communities of color? I know we kind of mentioned how the pandemic changed and shifted education. And so I guess this question is just like, oh, what's next? Like, you know, what can we do for the African community, African-American students after, as we transition not completely out of the pandemic, but as we can transition through the pandemic. 
That's right. There have been tremendous examples of schools that were able to be nimble. There are examples of charter schools that were able to serve beyond their their school communities. And that bringing bringing people together in a crisis is either a form of a trauma bond that is helpful, but it's also an opportunity for people to step outside of how they've traditionally been doing things and looking for things to sit differently. At the National Charter Collaborative, overall, I'm thinking about and concerned about what does it look like to make sure that there, the conditions for schools means that we have the supply of new schools, the supply and opportunity to grow schools that are doing exceptionally well? Thinking about how do you strengthen the, the leaders of those schools currently to make sure that they are doing so, 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 so much and doing it well, right? And how do we make sure that we're improving what they do? And we have a fellowship, the Manati Fellowship, which is the Swahili word for catapult. How do we catapult them into deeper and better, more meaningful leadership? And then how do we sustain the folks that are in this work and make sure that people know about the work and have the opportunity again, that cycle of when you open up the opportunity, you open up the opportunity for more people to create schools and to create schools that are thinking about and leaning into community. Because we know with communities, all types of things can happen. You, you maximize what's possible in the learning and teaching of students. You maximize what's possible for public education and making sure that it's stronger. How do we co-design schools with communities? We know that the neighborhood priorities and where schools are located are important. But all of this is how do we get closer to liberation and making sure that the, the goals that students have for themselves, be them African-American or other students of color, how do we create the opportunity for them to do what gives them the best path for a meaningful life after they leave the K-12 space? Wow. Well, thank you so much for that. Thank you for being on our Educate podcast. Everything that you said was definitely value added to what we may have not known or what we may have known, but added extra you know, information on there. So I just want to say thank you for that. You have just completed the most recent episode of the Educate podcast. Thank you for listening to the most fired up educational podcast out. Tune in every first Wednesday of each month at 5 p.m. during the 2021 through 2022 academic year.